Cram. Welcome to another COVID-19 update. We're going to talk about Biden's test results being positive again after he tested negative. This is a rebound case, and we're going to talk about why this might be happening and what does it have to do with Paxlovid. So President Biden first tested positive on July 21st. And at that time, the president's physician said that he had the following symptoms. He had a runny nose, he had a fever, he had fatigue, and he had a cough. And at that time, he was given a prescription for Paxlovid. And for more information on this medication, you can see our explained clearly video on Paxlovid and a number of other videos at medcram.com for continuing education for healthcare professionals or if you're just interested. Paxlovid is a five-day course. The CDC recommends that you isolate for five days as well, which the president did. So for a three-day period of time after that, the president was testing twice a day, and he was negative. Then on July 30th, early in the morning, the president tested positive. And according to reports, he was not having any symptoms. And just so you're aware, the president got two doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine prior to his inauguration in January of 2021. He got his first booster in September of 2021 and his second booster in March of 2022. And this brings up an interesting point because there's been some debate as to whether or not Paxlovid would be effective in people who have been vaccinated. As you may or may not know, and you can look at our video on Paxlovid, it was tested in people who are at high risk for progression of hospitalization. And because they wanted to create a study that was not very large, they wanted to create a study that had sufficient power to actually detect a difference, they chose to look at those that were not vaccinated and had risk factors leading them to possible hospitalization. Of course, it reduced hospitalization by 90% according to the studies in the phase three trials. However, here it's being used in somebody who's not only vaccinated, but also double boosted afterwards. So what information is there out there regarding this issue? Both the FDA and Pfizer, which makes Paxlovid, have said that only one to two percent in that study of both people who were getting Paxlovid or placebo had rebound. But again, remember that this population was a population that was not vaccinated. Pfizer was actually looking to see whether or not Paxlovid could work in patients who were vaccinated. And so they started the EPIC-SR study. But unfortunately, they had to give it up because the progression to hospitalization was so rare in both groups that they were not able to meet statistical significance. They say here in this article regarding this issue, the clinical trial previously flopped on its primary goal, showing that the Pfizer antiviral was no better than placebo at sustaining symptom relief for four consecutive days. Now the company is calling it quits on the study after finding it hard to read any signs of potential benefit because of an already low rate of hospitalization or death in the standard risk population. And you can see here in terms of the numbers, for those that were in the placebo group, there were 569 patients, and 10 of them had gone on to progress to severe COVID, whereas in the intervention arm with Paxlovid, almost an equal number of patients, there were only five. But even though it was half the number, because there were so few numbers overall, they could not reach statistical significance. And of course, you could bring up the point and say, well, if you were to enroll another thousand or so, it might actually progress. But the key to understanding this is understanding the future here. And that is, is as this pandemic has gone on, there have been less and less severe outcomes with COVID-19. And so from a financial impact, it would be not worth extending a study to get a indication that is becoming less and less common. What do you do if you actually do have rebound after Paxlovid treatment or just rebound in general? I'll point you to this CDC health advisory that actually goes over exactly what the recommendations are. The first point for healthcare providers is to understand that there's currently no evidence that additional treatment is needed for rebound, that the recommendation is to re-isolate for at least another five days and can end after five days if they haven't had a fever for 24 hours prior. 
they do recommend here to wear a mask for a total of 10 days after rebound symptoms have started. And of course, if those rebound symptoms worsen, to make sure that that gets evaluated and to report these rebound symptoms so they can get a better idea about what it is that's going on. And of course, we'll put a link in the description below. So where exactly are we right now in terms of the pandemic? I work in Southern California, and I work in San Bernardino and Riverside counties. And the San Bernardino County dashboard is actually pretty helpful. If we look at the number of cases per day, there has been an increase recently here going into the summer, and just as of recently, a slight decrease. Now, of course, realize that the amount of testing that's being done per case is much, much less than we were getting earlier on in the pandemic. So it's taken with a grain of salt. But one of the things that really doesn't get affected by testing is hospitalizations. And as you can see, hospitalizations are on the rise here in Southern California. The thing, though, that you have to remember is that while hospitalizations are hard to decide, I mean, patients can't decide whether they be hospitalized or not. If they have to come to the hospital, they will come. The problem, though, is that everybody that gets admitted to the hospital gets a SARS-CoV-2 test. And so you can have, as we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, people coming into the hospital with very classic symptoms of hypoxemia, of bilateral infiltrates with ground glass, and oh yes, they are positive for SARS-CoV-2. This is actually COVID-19. So the question is, is, are they COVID-19 patients that are being admitted, or is it because that the virus is so prevalent in the community that, of course, people are going to come in with their regular appendicitis, gallbladder disease, congestive heart failure exacerbation, urinary tract infections, and also, yes, they are just so happen to coincidentally have SARS-CoV-2. And up to a few months ago, for the last few months, in fact, I would say that the majority of the patients that I was seeing in the hospital with SARS-CoV-2 were having it as a coincidence. Over the last week or so, I've just been in the intensive care unit, and there have been a number of patients that have come in pretty sick, not necessarily with classic COVID-19 symptoms with bilateral ground glass infiltrates and things of that nature, but things that are associated potentially with COVID-19, for instance, strokes, seizure disorders, even congestive heart failure exacerbations. And I wonder in the back of my mind whether or not the SARS-CoV-2 positivity is an innocent bystander or whether it's a cause and effect. And the question is, is how would one know? Well, if this truly is a viral phenomenon, then as the virus grows, we should start to see an increase in numbers in overall admissions to the hospital. Folks, I can tell you back here in early 2021, we had two patients in one ICU room where we would normally need to only have one. We were overflowing. We had to create a new COVID-19 unit outside of our intensive care unit. We had nurses that would normally be taking care of two patients, taking care of four patients. We were running out of resources. I worked personally 35 days in a row because there was just no one else to be able to do all of this. We all sort of had to be all hands on deck to do what we needed to do. That clearly right now is not the case. We are not overflowing currently right now in our hospitals. And that very well may be because the current virus is less virulent. It could be that more people have either immunity from vaccinations or previous infection, or it could very well be that the virus has not yet reached its peak incidence. But as we've said before, we are headed towards the wintertime. And this graph here showing very specifically an increase in the number of hospitalizations either because of or with SARS-CoV-2 positivity is an area of concern. With the seasons, you can see a very similar upswing curve here underneath this increased delta wave that we saw in 2021. If your question is about whether or not vaccination matters at this point, then I think a great place to get some data is the New York State COVID-19 breakthrough data, which looks at the current estimates of cases and hospitalizations by vaccine status. And this has been updated. The print is pretty small, but you can see here on the 3rd of May in 2021, so basically just after they started vaccination of the general population, you can see here fully vaccinated rate per 100,000 was 2.0, and in the unvaccinated, it was 24.7. In terms of hospitalizations, fully vaccinated, it was 0 0.36 per 100,000 and 3.5 five per 100,000 in the unvaccinated. If we jump down to the most recent, which is the July 18 week of 2022, we can see here that it is 30.5 per 100,000 in the vaccinated for cases 
and 133.6 per 100,000 in the unvaccinated for cases. In terms of hospitalizations, we see here at 1.81 per 100,000 in terms of vaccinated hospitalizations and 12.42 in terms of hospitalizations in the unvaccinated. Of course, this very last bar here has some uncertainty because there is data coming through. If you want to look at the most certain data, you can go back here and look at June 27th. And what we're seeing here is that there is a almost eight-fold increased risk of hospitalization in the unvaccinated, even in June of 2022. The other thing to take note of is notice how these numbers, even in a specific column, will change over time. And that has to do with, of course, when there is a wave of infections. If there is a wave of infections, you'll notice that even in the vaccinated, there is an increase going from 13 per 100,000 all the way up to 300 per 100,000. Nothing is perfect, and there are risks with everything, so we need to look at the risk-to-benefit ratio. For some that are more visual, you can see here in graph format, going again all the way back to May and to the current time period, you can see here in blue, that is the unvaccinated in terms of cases per 100,000, and in red is the vaccinated. If we look at hospitalizations, take a look here and you can see that the difference between cases, you can see that the vaccine does perform, but doesn't perform as well as with hospitalizations and the worst outcomes. And you can see here again, in terms of the daily hospitalization rate per 100,000 population, hospitalization rate for those that are unvaccinated in blue and hospitalization rate per 100,000 fully vaccinated. And you can see even today with the vaccines that are designed specifically on the original spike protein, not on Omicron, they still have the ability to protect against the most severe forms of COVID-19 even today. And we'll put a link in the description below for that one as well. And if you want more information about the coronavirus pandemic updates, we have the entire course on our medcram.com website, where we also have courses that explain your laboratory results, ECG interpretation, CBC results, and a number of other courses which have continuing medical education credits associated with them. So join us at medcram.com.